Well, this is the seventh part of our seven-part sermon series, things that should be repeated from time to time. Many times churches like to get on topical situations and topical ideas, and that's fine as well, as long as they always bring it back to the Word of God, of course. But there are seven fundamental things that we've been going through that need to be repeated from time to time. We don't want to forget them as part of our, uh, our worship of the Lord, as part of our understanding, as part of our personal theology. The first one was that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Number two, the church is an essential part of God's plan, now and forever. And number three, which we preached on Easter Sunday, salvation is all about the cross. Number four, we are not saved by good works, but saved unto God works. Number five, if you have faith, you will pray. Last week we talked about the church existing by evangelism and missions. And today, the Bible is the inspired word of God. These aren't in any particular order, by the way, but seven things... Fundamental things that we felt need to be repeated, as we mentioned several times, repetition is effective. Repetition is effective. Repetition is effective. Repetition is effective. Pastor Joe McKeever said, don't be afraid of repeating yourself. Repetition is the mother of learning and sometimes a pastor's best friend. And what's the best way that we learn Scripture? As we memorize Bible verses, you repeat it over and over and over again. You say it over again. How do you know the songs? We know some of the basic hymns by heart. If I asked any one of you to sing a first verse of Amazing Grace, I'm sure every one of you could do that because you've sung it so many times because repetition is effective. So it's important that we repeat the fact that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Let's not forget that. Paul told Timothy, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit but to the subverting of hearers. In Deuteronomy, Moses told the, the folks there, the, the parents especially, these commandments, the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. He says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and they sh thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And, of course, to your children's children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words... Repeat it often, repeat it continuously, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy head, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. In other words, always before you. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Repetition is effective, and it comes with the Word of God. The Word of God is important. However, we seem to get busy sometimes. What happens if you go a few days without reading your Bible? And most of you, if you were honest, you'd have to say there's maybe been a couple of times where, you know, things just kind of got ahead of me and, and I just, I'd skip my daily Bible reading for a day or two or three. But you find out that the more days you skip, the harder it is to get back to it. You ever noticed that as well? You sort of start resisting that urge to get back to it. Well, nothing bad has really happened to me the last couple of days. And church is tomorrow, so I'll hear plenty of scripture in church tomorrow. And I'm tired and I think I'll just go to bed now and it'll be fine. And it gets harder to do that. You get your fix on Sunday morning, well, I'm good for the week. The question is, are you really good for the week? The more you cave into that laziness, and that's really what it is, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, resents picking up the Word and opening it, the more you will find yourself saying or thinking that, oh, well, I've already read the Bible, I know what it says, so I don't go back and read my favorite book over and over and over again, maybe pick it up every few years and read it my favorite novel or, or whatever it might be. There's nothing new in there, by the way. You know, God hasn't changed. We know God is from everlasting to everlasting. His word never changes, so nothing has changed. I've read the book from cover to cover. Maybe at some point in time you got a hold of one of those read the Bible in a year schedules and you went through it an entire year and you patted yourself on the back on December 31st. You made it through. Well, I've read the whole book. I'm, I'm good to go. But you know what? The Holy Spirit still has so much more to teach you. And if you would read that again, I would encourage you to do that every year if you could. Read that. If not the whole Bible, read something, certainly something every day. There's a lot of good study guides out there. Uh, we have some right here in our vestibule you can take with you. If you're online, you can get a lot of great uh, information as well as commentaries and Bible dictionaries to really kind of help bring these things alive, especially those things that may be a little bit more difficult to understand. It also gives you perspective of when these things were written, what the world was like at that time. So you will continuously learn about the Bible. You can study it every day, hour, eight hours a day, every day of your life. You'll never get through it all. We'll continue, the Bible says we'll actually continue to learn God's Word even when we're in heaven. Even with the living Word is right there teaching us. Can you imagine being in Jesus' Sunday school class someday? He's up there teaching and he's teaching on the 23rd Psalm, for example. 
And he'll bring out, and he said, well, you've heard some wonderful testimonies. We heard one this morning. Jesus is going to bring something out we never considered. Probably just looked at that a thousand times, and he brings something out about the 23rd Psalm that just never crossed our mind before. Or John 3.16. Or any of the other, your favorite uh, Bible verses this morning that you've memorized, and you know them by heart, backwards and forwards, and yet when he's teaching us, it's going to be, how do we possibly miss that? Well, the fact that there's nothing new there is really just a lie out of hell itself. Because we don't know the Bible. We've not read it all. You may have read at it, but there's a world of content there which we've not really mined. And it's not boring. One pastor said, the Bible's not boring. You're boring. The Word's not boring. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to start there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul, of course, talking to the church at Corinth. He has a lot to say to that church, by the way. It's not just for the church of Corinth, by the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, which, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Holy Ghost is our teacher this morning. We read the Word of God. That's our textbook. And the Holy Spirit is teaching us. Guiding us through that. Bringing things alive in our hearts and our minds. Things we never contemplated before. Things we never saw before. That's why you get those aha moments when you're reading the Bible. That's the Holy Spirit who's told you something that you just recognized for the first time perhaps. Maybe it's tied together with something you went through during that earlier that day. Or something you went through in a previous week. The Holy Spirit is saying, remember that thing you went through last week, that problem you had with your boss or with your parents or with your children or with your neighbor? And then all of a sudden you read something in the Word of God and it ties it all together. Aha! Now I see where the situation went. I see what went wrong. I see where maybe I went wrong or I see where the situation went wrong. Because the Holy Spirit just taught you something out of the Word of God. The spirit of this world says reading the Bible is not important. That's the God of this world. Small g, God of this world. Besides, as I said, you know, the pastor will read multiple verses on Sunday, and, and uh, we read verse we've read. Actually, today seemed to be Psalm Day. We read several passages out of the book of Psalms today, which is wonderful. My father's favorite book in the, in the Bible. And that's great. But we still don't know everything there is to know about Psalms, or even David. So much more. Remember what John said at the end. If, <clears throat> if, we, if they tried to, to document everything that Jesus did just during the three and a half or so years of his earthly ministry, all the libraries in the world wouldn't be able to contain everything that he said. So how much, that's all that's still, that we still need to learn, all the stuff they didn't write down. We just have, we sort of scratched the surface in the Gospels of Jesus' ministry, and then the explanation in the Pauline letters and some of the other letters, we just, but John said, we, there's so much stuff there that we haven't even, we can't even contain it in all the books in the world. So when we get to heaven, we're going to start digging into some of those items as well. So it just shows you there's so much more we don't know. The more, And if you read the Bible honestly, the more you read, the more you realize you don't know. So why is it important to read and study the Bible? We're going to look at a couple of questions this morning that has to do with this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. A verse that you all know, I'm sure, very well. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfected, or thoroughly equipped, or thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The NIV says that it's good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God, the servant of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you uh, work with your hands, you probably have a toolbox. If you go to work in a machine shop, for example, or an auto part, uh, you know, auto repair center, you bring your own tools with you. And uh, very often, if you go around town, you'll see the big tool trucks, the snap-on tool trucks. You've seen those out on the roads, and they go from business to business to business. And what they do is they park their truck in the parking lot. The employees come out, and they go, uh, you know, I need a new ratchet setter. I need a new uh, set of wrenches, or I need screwdrivers, or whatever it might be, some tools. Those tools, the employees buy their own tools. So when you wear something out, you have to go to the snap-on truck or one of the other trucks that come around and you buy your tools from the guy right out of the back of his truck. So you need tools in order to do your job. Well, as a Christian, we have a job. We mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. It's called the Great Commission. But you need some tools in order to fulfill the Great Commission. Here's your toolkit. And then we have an instructor 
a manual, if you will, the instruction manual is the Holy Spirit that teaches us how to use the toolkit so that we could go forth, proclaim the gospel message, and fulfill the Great Commission. So the scripture, why is it important to read the Bible? Because it is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Why? So that you and I can be for, uh, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We're a product of what it is that we read and what it is that we study. So who is the author? Why is this so important? Well, 2 Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the agnostics and the atheists out there will say, well, it's just a man-made written manual, you know. It's got a lot of flowery prose and some nice poetry and things like that, but it's just a, a man's construct. And what they don't understand is, however, is the fact that this was inspired by God himself, by his Holy Spirit. And I will tell you that there's statistics here in just a moment of how this Bible was put together. And it's amazing when you think about that, how the Bible was composed. But in these verses, Jesus is reinforcing the accuracy of the Scriptures. In Matthew 5, 17, in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus is speaking, he's telling the folks, you need to pay attention to every single one of these words. Every word, not just every sentence or every paragraph or every phrase, but every word is important. Jesus wasn't wasting words when he was preaching and teaching there on the hillside. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He's saying every word, every punctuation mark, everything in the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Especially in the original autographs in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. Every single word is there for a purpose in the Bible. In all 66 books, he didn't waste any words. Every single word, every book was put there for a purpose. Jesus, again, reinforcing the accuracy of scriptures down to the smallest in detail and the slightest punctuation mark. Job, remember Job, he said, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. He's saying, your spiritual food that you give me, Lord, is even more important than the physical food that I take in. So if we died because we were hungry and we went to heaven, that would be better than have a belly full and go to hell. If you want to put it in those terms. But the good news is, of course, that God meets our needs. Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, it's great to be full. It's nice to be full. After we leave church here today, we'll all retire to our homes or maybe to a local restaurant and we'll have a, our fill for lunch and we'll be happy and we'll do whatever it is we do in Sunday afternoon. But what good would that do if we were to die today on the way home and we don't know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior? What if we died with a belly full and went, home and went to hell? Or if we were hungry and went to heaven? What's our, and it's our choice. David said, The godly man's delight is in the word of the Lord and in his law, and in his word doth he meditate day and night. Psalm 1. So how was the Bible composed? Well, first of all, we know it's not just one single book, but a collection of 66 letters and books. And it is a part of our Judeo-Christian background. It's called a canon, the canon of scriptures, and it contains a variety of genres. I mentioned poetry as history and prophecy, wisdom, literature, letters, and, uh, and other descriptions. Very, very accurate historical book, by the way. You know, there wasn't so long ago, less than 100 years ago, many scientists and archaeologists dismissed the, the accuracy of the book. They talked about ancient civilizations. They said, well, as far as we know, they never existed. We have no documentation. We haven't seen anything on the hieroglyphics on the walls of caves in Egypt or in the pyramids or anything like that. You know, these are just fables. And then they start digging into these mounds, into these tells, and they find, oh, wait a minute. That could be the civilization that was they were talking about back in First Kings, or oh wait a minute, that was a that was a town that was that was described back in Leviticus, or, or wait a minute, and all of a sudden every single time they can tie it back to the Bible was accurate and science had it wrong. Amen. So science is there to prove that the Bible was correct all along. Amen. So the Bible came first, the word came first, science came along. There were some Christian scientists who understood the best way to start is right here, but there are also many who said, my job is to try, try to disprove the Bible. Yeah. And they have egg on their face, because they're always wrong, because the Bible is always right. 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years, by the way, and in three different languages, Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, Greek, Koine Greek, and Aramaic. 
a reflection of the historical and cultural circumstances, written on three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and yet no contradictions. Most of these authors didn't know each other. And they were writing as the Holy Spirit inspired them, and they were in different parts of the world, and yet no contradictions. In fact, it comes together seamlessly when you put it all together. That's why, you, why the 66 books, when there were other books that were being discussed, because there were some books, some Gnostic Gospels, and some other writings that had contradictions in there, and that, that they weren't sure it could be accurate, so uh, they erred on the side of caution. Of course, as the Holy Spirit uh, gave them guidance and direction, they came up with the 66 <coughs> canonical books that we call our Bible today. The Bible itself gives a test to all messages claiming to be from God, and you are to judge the merits of the message by that test. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 to 22, again, it says, But the prophet, that's the person speaking on behalf of God, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. In other words, a person who presents himself as a prophet, but is not speaking God's word. Or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. There are serious consequences if you portend or pretend to speak on God's behalf and you're speaking on Satan's behalf. Because it's one or the other. There's no in-between. You're either speaking on behalf of God or you're speaking on behalf of Satan. And if you're speaking on behalf of Satan and you're attributing it to God, die. It says you're, you're, you're dying. You're dead spiritually. You're going to die physically. If, and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Well, here's the test. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord... And if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. And if the person is wrong once, don't trust them again for the second time. They're wrong. Because they're speaking of a false, out of a false spirit, a false doctrine. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So if he pronounces doom and gloom, but you know that he's not speaking God's word, or what he's saying contradicts God's word, then you can just ignore it. You can just dismiss it. Because he's not guided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will speak through man, but he will always say something that is in agreement with the written word of God. There will never be a contradiction. There's no new revelation that, oh, by the way, you can ignore uh, you know, Philemon now, or you can ignore parts of Revelation. I've got a new word. If you hear a quote-unquote prophet say that. Or the Bible was incomplete and they come up with their own book. And we're going to supplement the Bible with this prophet's words, like the Book of Mormon, for example. You can dismiss that because the Bible tells us it is complete. There is no other word. You cannot add to it or the plagues of the book will be added to you. You cannot take anything away from it or the, your name will be taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's the book you, need, you want your name in because that's what gets you to heaven. If your names are not written there, you're not going to heaven. So don't take anything out of the Lamb's Book of Life, out of the Bible, or your name will be taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life. J. Barton Payne in his Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy he lists 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament, 578 prophecies in the New Testament, for a total of 1,817 prophecies, which encompass about 8,352 verses. Every single one of those prophecies so far has come true. Not a single one has not come true. The ones that have not come true have just not yet been fulfilled because they are yet to come. Some in our own lifetime, I believe. Some perhaps may be past that, should the Lord tarry. 1,817 verse, uh, uh, prophecies. Every single one up to this, up today has come true. And there's been a lot that were historical prophecies, and we can test them to see whether or not they were true or not, and yet they all were true. Speaking of the Messiah, for example, a lot of prophecies about the coming Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, focus of the Old Testament. There are over 300 separate prophecies about the Holy One of Israel, Jesus. And they are so specific as to predict the city of Jesus' birth, Bethlehem in Micah 5.2, his nature in Isaiah 7.14, his works of healing and miracles in Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, his betrayal for 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah 11, 12 and 13, his suffering in Isaiah chapter 53, his style of execution in Psalm 22, his resurrection in Psalm 16 and Acts 13, amongst many others. Very specific prophecies. Remember what we just said, if you, the prophet is wrong in one, then just discard everything else they have to say. So if any one of these prophecies were not true, we could just discard the whole book. If Isaiah got one prophecy wrong, we should just discard all of Isaiah. But guess what? Every single one so far has come true, exactly as Isaiah described it. These prophecies were written anywhere from 400 to 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus. And yet they describe his life with the accuracy of an eyewitness. 
The odds against a living person meeting even a few of these predictions is so astronomical it's considered an impossibility. I think I shared this with you a number of years ago, but I thought it was interesting and, and I was reminded of again. Here's an example of how difficult it would be for one person, Jesus, to fulfill every single prophecy in the Bible, some written anywhere from 400 to 1,000 years before he was even born. In 1957, Moody Press in Chicago published a book by Professor Peter Stoner called Science Speaks, an Evaluation of Certain Christian Evidences. He says, I'm making use of the well-known principle of probability. If the chance of one thing happening is 1 in M, and the chance of another independent thing happening is 1 in N, then the chance that they both shall happen is 1 in M times N. So he gave us an example for those of us who are not as mathematically literate, perhaps, as we should be. Suppose one man in every 10 is bald. One man in 100 has lost a finger. I haven't, but... So what do you find out? How many men are bald and have lost a finger? You multiply the two together. So in his case, one out of every thousand men is bald and has lost a finger. So that's the, the way the probability works. So then you take all these prophecies, not just taking two prophecies, by the way, hundreds of prophecies in the Bible just about Jesus. So there are a lot of other prophecies. We have a lot of prophecies about the end times that still have yet to be fulfilled. A lot of other prophecies as well. Many of you are familiar with Lee Strobel former agnostic and author of The Case for Christ and The Case for Faith and The Case for Easter, he used this information, noted that the statistical odds of select messianic prophecies coming true is documented in Science Speaks, which was written by uh, Professor Stoner, that gave him the confidence to believe in Christ. In other words, he read the professor's works, and he was an agnostic. Strobel was an attorney, he was an agnostic, didn't know whether or not there was a God, wasn't sure, you know. Wasn't an atheist necessarily, but still wouldn't necessarily necessarily believed in, in God or a God. So he went back and he looked at all the prophecies and he came up with this math. He says we have one in two point eight times one hundred thousand times a thousand times a hundred times a thousand times a thousand times one hundred thousand times a thousand times ten thousands, and as the probabilities of all those coming together, it gives us one in two point eight times ten to the twenty eighth power. Do you remember your scientific notation? 1 times 10 with a little 28 superscript there. That's 28 zeros. That is the odds that one man would fulfill every one of those prophecies as he fulfilled them in the Bible. We don't have a name for that. You know, we go to billions and trillions and quadrillions and quintillions and whatever. We don't have a name for 1 in times 10 to the 28th power, as far as I know. So he says, suppose we take someone and blindfold them and cover the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. Texas is a huge state. You ever try driving across that state on Route 40? It goes on forever. It's a big place. And it's boring out west too, by the way. It's just flat prairie land everywhere you look. It's like Kansas without the corn, you know. Huge place. You take all that and you fill that up with silver dollars two feet deep. Now, what if you just took a building like ours, building right here, and you filled it up with silver dollars two feet deep, so, you know, right up to about your knee maybe, a little bit depending on the height, maybe some of you a thigh, and you marked one of those silver dollars. Just put an X on it. Then you blindfolded somebody and said, go find that one, you have one chance, go find that silver dollar that's marked. Could you even do it if it was just this room? Odds are very, very small. You may, maybe, somebody give enough people, enough opportunities, you have thousands of people to go in here and maybe one of them will pick up that. But then you take the entire state of Texas, and you fill it up with silver dollars two feet deep, thousands of square miles. Blindfold somebody and say, okay, start walking and start digging. Well, you know, most people get about maybe a couple hundred yards and they get tired and bored walking on all the silver dollars and they reach down there and they fish around and say, is this it? When you know it's actually down in Houston somewhere or over in Waco or who knows where the silver dollar might be. Those are the odds that Jesus would fulfill every single one of the prophecies that he did fulfill as described by the Old Testament prophets. So who can say that the Bible is not inspired by God's Word, by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit? So we need to keep preaching its insights and delighting in its treasures, and eventually people will get it because God's Word never returns to Him empty, the Bible says. Repetition is a great teacher. And in fact, it may be the best teacher on the planet. So as we consider the Bible as the inspired Word of God, we have scientific proof because of the prophecies. No other holy book, quote-unquote holy book, can make this claim, by the way. 
There's a lot of quote-unquote holy scriptures out there. There's books and there's pamphlets and there's magazines and, you know, somebody may come to your door and try to slip a watchtower into your hands or something like that. All false religions, all cults, or many of them are cults, uh, Christian cults even, because they use the name of Jesus, but they don't understand Jesus, that he is the only begotten Son of God, always has been, is, and always will be. He is, I am. And anybody who says otherwise, there's a red flag, it's a false religion. This Bible is the only thing that is inspired. There is nothing more, nothing less, nothing more that you need in this life, but it just, is, just scratches the surface of everything that Jesus taught and said, as we've heard before. Can you imagine what it will be like? And we will go on through eternity, and He'll continue to teach us. Class will be in session, and we'll be awed, and we will be amazed at everything that He teaches us. So as Christians this morning, if somebody tries to take a pot shot at you, remember that you stand on the rock, the Word of God. Now, I neglected to mention something in our prayer circle this morning that I uh, would ask for your prayers for, especially tomorrow. During my radio show tomorrow morning, some of you may know the name Barry Lynn is going to be in studio, along with a local atheist. Barry Lynn is a, supposed to be a, a pastor. Uh, he is the one who's uh, responsible for the group called the Americans United for Separation of Church and State. They've been in the news for many years. And any time uh, a... Borough council or city council tries to open up with prayer. It's his group that goes in there immediately and sues them and says, you can't do that. Uh, his group is one that's gone all over the country and tried to sue to take the Ten Commandments off of courtroom walls. Uh, those of you familiar with Ken Hams and the, the Genesis uh, group in Kentucky that's building the, the life-size uh, uh, Noah's Ark uh, has been battling with them because <clears throat> the state of Kentucky has said, if you're developing a tourist site, we will give you a rebate on your taxes to help you uh, with your site, help your museums, or whatever it is that you're building, your water parks and so forth, and uh, we will give you uh, an incentive, a tax incentive to, uh, you know, create, because we want to attract tourism to our state. Well, this obviously would be a huge tourist attraction for Christians especially to go along with this creation museum, which is uh, there in Indiana. So he started building this life-size art. It's going to be $28 million, I think, in order for him to build the entire thing. It's already under construction. You can go to arkencounter.com or .org and kind of see you know, where they are in any particular case. Well, his group has gone against that. And so you can't give them tax breaks because that's taxpayer money, and uh, it's a Christian organization, and uh, so you can't give them any kind of breaks. And what they're saying is we're not giving you taxpayer money. We're just not making you pay as many taxes as you normally would if you were building a or office building or something. So, But at, any, at every turn, and though he calls himself a, a minister, and he, uh, some sort of a Christian minister, I think he classifies himself as a Christian, but he's going to be in the studio tomorrow, and the atheists are going to have some kind of convention or something in Philadelphia, and, and he's uh, there to speak to them. And the first thing that came to my mind, what fellowship has light with darkness? Why are you palling around with these people in the first place instead of witnessing to them? You should be telling these people that they are on the pathway to perdition, to hell, and it's a broad and it's a wide path, and there's many people going down that unless you accept and acknowledge Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior so that you can go to heaven when you pass from this earth. Instead, he is joining with them and encouraging them in their, uh, in their path to do everything that is really anti-Christian, anti-theist, or atheism. So he's going to be in a studio. I didn't invite him, by the way. My station manager invited him, and he was ostensibly there to interview them. I'm going to try to get my two or three or four cents in while I'm there anyway. So just pray for, I uh, appreciate your prayers for me, but I'm going to give him the word. I'm going to, my, my strategy was at some point to ask him, so, you know, do you consider yourself a Christian minister? I'm going to assume he'll probably say, he might even hem and haul a little bit, well, yes, I believe in God. And then I'm going to ask him about that verse, well, then why are you fellowshipping with these people? instead of witnessing to them. And I'm sure he'll hem and haul and he'll come up with some answers. I'm sure I'm not the first person to ever bring this question up to him. You can actually Google. Uh, I did uh, look at some YouTube videos of him and some other interviews and so forth just to kind of get a sense of, of what he says and what he does. But he obviously doesn't stand on the Word of God because the Word of God is very clear. We are not to befriend them. We are to witness them to them in love, in Christian love. But the point is if you truly love somebody, you're going to give them the truth. You have a, a, a small child, a two-year-old, and the ball rolls out into the street and they start to dart after it. If you truly love the child, you will grab them if you can and yank them back from the curb or you will yell at them to stop where they are or you will do something to physically restrain them if, if possible so that they don't get hit by a car when they go out and chase the ball. Why do you do that? Because you love them. You discipline them. Don't you ever do that again. 
you, you're right. So if you truly love them, you will discipline them. If you have a child who is uh, in the kitchen and there's a pot of boiling water up there and the child is just almost big enough to reach up and grab the handle of that boiling water, you might slap your hand away at the last second. It's going to sting. It's going to hurt. They're going to cry. Did you hit them because you hated them? Did you hit them because you want to abuse them? You smack their hand because you love them because you know that that sting will go away in a few seconds, but that scalding water may scar them for the rest of their life. Sometimes we need to be disciplined. And we need to be disciplined as a need to be disciplined in reading the Bible. We also need discipline, and that's why the Bible says God disciplines us at times as well. So if you truly love people, you will speak the truth. And we have the truth here. Jesus is the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. And he is the word of God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. All right? So he went back to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us, but he left us the word. So this is Jesus right here. This is the Word of God. But He was the Word made flesh. This is the Word made in paper. And, but it comes alive. It's a living, breathing document. So I encourage you to read your Bible. Read it every day. Read it a couple of times every day. Put some verses on your mirror in the morning like my wife does. Uh, she has a tape there, so something to read while she's brushing her teeth. Or wherever it is that you do. Maybe it's over breakfast. Maybe it's at lunchtime. Maybe on your dashboard. I've heard of people put verses on their dashboard in their car. So the first thing they see when they get in the car and turn the key is that verse of the day. Lots of great ways that you can keep the Word of God in front of you at all times. And you will be blessed. You will be encouraged. And you'll be smarter. Because the Holy Spirit is teaching you that day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your Word and your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for instructing us in righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that your Word never returns to you, Father. Never returns void to you. We thank you that it is a living, breathing Word. It comes alive in us as your Holy Spirit speaks to us. We thank you for the instructions that it has. We thank you for the message of salvation, most importantly, because that is the key to our eternal life. Perhaps there is somebody here this morning who has yet to receive that key, who has yet to respond to the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now, inviting you to come into the family of God, acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you've been hesitant before, why not give and yield to the Holy Spirit right now? He wants you to come and join the family of God to recognize Jesus Christ as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior. He died on the cross for you. His blood was shed to wash away the sins in your life, not His. And you can become a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. If you will yield and say, Yes, Lord, I believe. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Come into my heart, into my life, and be my Savior. I will live for you and put away all other gods in my life. Thank you, Father, for those prayers. Perhaps there are Christians here this morning who are praying for loved ones who need to Pray that prayer. We all have people in our lives. We all have people in our families that we've been witnessing to and praying for. Lord, hear our prayers. May your Holy Spirit continue to burden them, continue to buffet them, continue to bring the Word of God in front of them, Lord. Send people across their path this week to witness to them. Maybe uh, out of the blue, a surprise would be a surprise to them, but not to us, Lord, because we know that you have people out there on the streets. And even us, Lord, use us to be an effective witness as well. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your blessings today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.